given that the yearling sales are starting now, um, how would you approach the values as buyer and as a seller? Well, first of all, I think the most important role of a budstock agent, or at least one of the most important ones, is to have a re really good sense of how to value horses. In a sale like this as a buyer, one would look to a degree at how the year has gone so far in terms of sales, uh, evaluate the horses principally based on confirmation, then obviously their valuation will vary uh, depending on how good or otherwise their pedigree is. Now this particular sale is a select sale and so uh, the valuation will be based on, for the most part, good individuals, although some of them will have veterinary issues. There are a multitude of, of possible variables in valuation, but the broad approach is a combination of pedigree, confirmation, and then looking at the market for the particular stallions that the horses are buying. As far as the seller is concerned, I mean, obviously, you've put a certain amount of money into these horses, both in terms of upkeep, pin hooking if you bought the horse as a foal and you're resetting it as a yearling, uh, stud fees, and the real determining factor about how a reserve is going to be set will be the amount of quote unquote action that the horse has had at the sale. You can tell to a degree by the amount of vetting and um, the amount of people that have looked at the horse, whether there's real interest in it. And then typically what I would do is set my value for selling at somewhere between two thirds and three quarters of what I hope the horse will make because I'm always a seller and somebody who wants to sell a horse needs to set their reserve in that kind of fashion. Thank you, Lincoln. Stud fees have also significantly decreased in recent years. How would that affect your value assessment in foals? Well, I mean, obviously, the, the biggest single capital input in breeding a horse and raising it is the stud fee. Um, historically, for mid-range stud fees, that would be from maybe fifteen to thirty thousand dollars. An acceptable price for a yearling has been three times, three times the stud fee. So, obviously, overall valuations have a tendency to come down when stud fees come down. Uh, but the second part of valuing a foal is that stud fees are obviously set more than a year before the foal is actually born. So, if the market is beginning to rise at the time that. Um, you know, that one's valuing a foal, the multiple may be more than the standard three times. If the market is bad and horses aren't selling, it might have to be less than that. But it's a combination of market conditions, a multiple of stud fee, and obviously, again, returning to what I was saying, the confirmation of the foal and the pedigree, the female pedigree. Further to that point, how would you account for the value of a broodmare when valuing foals? Well, we're valuing the foals, I mean, that, that, that again is a function of pedigree. So if the, if the brood mares, the brood mares part of the valuation depends on how good her pedigree is. If her pedigree is exceptionally good and she's bred to a lesser stallion, that's obviously going to make her value, the foals value, greater than it would have been if it was a kind of par pedigree for the stallion. So the mare is always very important in valuing, um, in valuing a foal, regardless of what the stallion that she's in foal is or the foal is by um, stands for. And so with regard to the stallions, certainly some are more popular than others. How do you assess the worth or share of the value of the stallion? The, the answer to that question really depends on how popular the stallion is and how many mares is he breeding. If it's a 40 share syndicate, or, the, or indeed the horse is only breeding 40 uh, mares a year, it's going to be a lot different situation than if he's one of the most popular stallions in Kentucky, where he'll breed, be breeding 150 mares in, in a year. So one would calculate the live foal income from the stallion, which will be about 80% of the number of mares that he covered, and then decide on a multiple of that based on the age of the horse. So a successful young horse of say seven or eight years old, one might look at uh, six or seven years of, of income 
in determining a value. If the horse is older, say 18 or 20 years, you might only take the value of the current year in which he's covering mares. But there, there are a lot of variables, but that's the, the, it, the with, st with stallions, it's all about the income that they can produce and coming up with a rational multiple of that to provide a valuation. The value changes quite a bit through the span of even one year of a racehorse career. Um, both before and after major races, such as the Kentucky Derby. Can you talk about that? You have to try to determine the exact moment in a horse's lifetime where he or she is at their most valuable. And obviously, if you're commercial, that's the moment to sell. It's a tough thing to do. And how do you advise your clients when they've reached the other side of that big race and their horse is no longer of those values? Well, I mean, again, it depends on the horse. If some of them are worth very little because the, the, the derby can take a lot out of them. Uh, if they get gelded, obviously, they're not going to have a stallion, uh, a stallion value, but may, may still have a significant value as a racehorse. But again, it has to be played race by race. Uh, and horses that don't maybe fail to or, or don't get sold of their own and decide not to sell them before the Kentucky Derby may go on and be extremely successful and become stallions in spite of having not run well in the Kentucky Derby. I mean, it may be the biggest day in thoroughbred racing, but it certainly isn't the end of the road as far as the value of your horse is concerned. I mean, I don't mean to give that impression. You know, any one of a number of grade one races can still make the horse extremely valuable. And as far as insurance goes, what's the importance of insuring for the correct value? Well, I think that's very important um, for two reasons. Number one, there's no point in spending more money than is necessary on I insuring a horse, presuming that one has uh, honest intent in insuring a horse in the first place. Um, you know, the, there are variables. Sometimes a horse is worth more. For example, a good broodmare may be worth more to her breeder legitimately than she would be in the open market. So if, for example, she's a good mare, but one year she doesn't get in foal, it wouldn't be fair to value her at what she'd make in a public auction because she has a value to him when she does get in foal the following year. And if anything happened to her, he would, he would have to replace her probably with an in foal mare. So there are variables. But essentially, I think it's always important to, to value at a fair market value, plus or minus a small amount at the discretion of Markel or whatever other insurance company it is, because that way the insurance company is comfortable with the, with the valuation and the owner has a realistic coverage if anything should go wrong or should die.